welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. This episode is a patron's choice. Once a quarter, I will put a poll up on my Patreon page and supporters at the $2 tier and above are able to vote for the next topic. And they selected this one. I'm very excited to discuss it. I want to talk about an Argentinian comic from the 1950s. It was a watershed publication that became a cultural phenomenon. It is a fantastic sci-fi story. It's a political allegory. And the work, in part, led to its creator's death. I want to talk about a book called El Eternata, or in English, The Eternot. Uh, it's an amazing book. There's a lot to say about it, but before we can dive in deep, we need to place this in its proper historical context. The Eternot was written by Hector Herman Esterheld, with artwork by Francisco Solano Lopez. It was published in a comic book magazine called Ora Cero Semanal that was published by Editorial Frontera. That publisher was established by Esterheld and his brother Jorge. The story ran weekly from 1957 through 1959, and it was a huge hit. It's a big, epic story, hundreds of pages long. The artwork by Lopez is equal to any of the great illustrations found in EC Comics in America at the same time period. In 1957, Argentina was two years past the coup d'etat of popular president Juan Perón. He was a very popular president who had spent his time since the mid-40s working on improving the wages for the working class, and this was something Esterheld was very passionate about. His characters tended to be working class. In the 60s, Argentina had increased economic challenges and Editorial Frontera was closed. Esterheld became more overtly political with his writing, including a 1968 comic book biography of the revolutionary Che Guevara a year after his death. This comic was subsequently banned by the Argentinian government. In 1975, Esterheld began publishing a sequel to The Eternat, which had more overtly political storylines. In 1976, the United States backed a right-wing regime which took control of Argentina and began a period known as the so-called Dirty War through 1983, in which more than 30,000 citizens were disappeared and killed. In 1977, Esterheld and his four daughters had joined the Montaneros, left-wing guerrilla resistance. They were all disappeared and presumed dead. Two of his daughters were pregnant at the time. I'm not sure if I can think of another comic book creator who was killed for their beliefs. Esther Held was a Peronist. He was a supporter of Juan Perón and his policies, and one of those pillars was social justice. That was explicitly one of the things that they supported. So you could literally say that he was killed for being a social justice warrior. But taking aside his politics, I think that you have to admire his courage and his bravery. And even though his work in the 60s and 70s was more political, the work in the 50s is more of a political allegory, and I think it stands on its own as just an awesome sci-fi story. It's worth noting the political influences, but it's readable even if you don't understand that context. Let's dive into the book itself. The story is about an alien invasion of Earth that is based in Buenos Aires. The protagonist is a young husband and father named Juan Salvo, and the story begins with him playing the card game Truco in his house's attic alongside his friends, including the engineer Favali. That evening, a heavy snow begins falling, and the group quickly learns that it's instantly lethal to the touch. A quick note, the climate in Buenos Aires is very similar to, say, Florida or Southern California. It's not unheard of to get snow, but it's rare to get a heavy snow out of nowhere. This is very anomalous. It's also worth noting that the name of the protagonist, Juan Salvo, is a type of a pun when you think about it. A salvo is, you know, a barrage of enemy fire, and yet he's the one under fire. It may also have a secondary meaning in its Spanish. Salvo might mean something like to be saved. That part I'm not as clear on. 
Juan Salvo's wife and his friend Favalli fashion an airtight suit that allows Juan, and eventually Favalli, to leave the house to forage for supplies and information. Along the way, they pick up young Pablo, who is locked in their local hardware store. The improvised suit, and especially the diving mask, has gone beyond being just a cool visual. It's become a cultural icon in Argentina. To this day, you can find graffiti throughout Argentina based on Lopez's artwork from the comic. Presumably, the visual represents in part the spirit of the individual. Early forays outside the house are incredibly dangerous for the survivors, not just from the lethal snow, but other survivors prove to be a threat. The weather and another survivor each kill one of Juan's friends. Eventually, Juan and his friends are recruited by a small remaining military force. While this gives the human survivors access to tanks, grenade launchers, and machine guns, we quickly learn that the weapons are hardly enough to counter the threats that emerge. The snow is not nuclear fallout from U.S. nuclear bomb testing, as Favalli initially suspects, but something much larger. Communications go down. Massive beetles attack and have access to a weapon the humans call a light thrower that disintegrates anything in its path. The beetles are the first indication that humanity is dealing with an alien invasion and that it may be a worldwide threat. Further threats emerge, including other humans. Favalli deduces that the beetles and humans are both controlled from afar by remote control devices affixed to their nervous systems. Along the way, the survivors have moments of hope when they capture a light thrower of their own, gain information, or gain new allies, like the young and brave metalworker Franco and the journalist Mosca. Favalli's clever mind leads to him being recruited into the military leadership, while Juan is placed in charge of the civilian militia drafted into service, who constantly serve as the frontline infantry. While Juan is the main character that we follow, at all times there's a small group that really forms the core cast of the story. And they sort of allow different viewpoints to be expressed. For instance, Franco's bravery and readiness to go into battle is a counterpoint to Favalli's uh, analytical mind. And meanwhile, we've got Juan as the stoic everyman that's right in the middle. And honestly, this reminded me a lot, for instance, of something like the original Star Trek, where Captain Kirk would hear differing viewpoints from Spock and Dr. McCoy, and then make his own informed decision on how to move forward. One cool part of the book is that we're constantly privy to Juan's inner thoughts. These days, comics don't focus as much on inner dialogues, but it's a useful tool within the medium of comic books. Juan's fears and hopes become reactions that we, the reader, are feeling, and it aligns us with him and makes us care about his plight of not just surviving, but somehow saving his wife and daughter who are hiding out back at his house. The threats continue to escalate for the human resistance. Mysterious clouds force hallucinations in the men, leading to disarray. Massive, elephantine monsters called Grubos knock down buildings, forcing the army into smaller and smaller circles. And Juan and Franco, on a scouting expedition, are captured by sentient aliens named Hands. These aliens control the remote beetles, robot men, and Grubos, but are ultimately revealed to be taking orders from a more powerful, unseen species referred to only as the cosmic evil called Them. The visual design of the hands are amazing, with many more fingers than humans, especially on the right arm, that were consoles controlling their biological weapons. It's later discovered that these aliens have an implant inside them that turns poisonous if they show fear, keeping them from resisting them. With hundreds of pages to this story, each new threat is given room to breathe and to exist as its own new escalation of the threat. Uh, it makes us root for humanity as the underdogs that much more because each time they have to work so hard to understand and figure out how to beat a new threat. It really is humanity's ingenuity that is the core asset to the small band of heroes that we follow. Over time, we see that it isn't any of mankind's weapons, not even nuclear missiles, that are capable of defeating the invasion, but their minds and their courage. Franco doesn't give up in the face of certain death. 
Favali convinces one of the hands that humanity is a threat, killing it with its own fear. The military eventually collapses in the face of the continuous alien threats, but Juan, Fava, Franco, and friends refuse to give up on humanity, and eventually their small force is able to bring down an alien command post in the heart of Buenos Aires. The team has to flee because the aliens are no longer able to stop the barrage of nuclear missiles that have been coming from the north, and Buenos Aires is leveled with atomic bombs. The story ends with a huge twist where the unseen them tricks humanity one last time. In a last ditch attempt to keep his wife and daughter safe, Juan enters an alien command ship and accidentally engages a time travel device that it uses as an engine. This throws him into an infinite number of parallel realities called continuums, where he constantly lives through different eras, constantly trying to reunite with his family. The story ends with Juan, now known as the Eternaut, telling his tale to the author of this comic. The author doesn't want to believe, but elements of the Eternaut's story appear true, and the book ends with the author knowing the alien invasion is due four years from now, and deciding to warn people through this very comic. That meta ending is a great twist. Also great is Fantagraphics' actual book that they give. It, you take off its slipcase cover, it's got a very dramatic piece here, and if you take off this cover, you can see our hero Juan Salvo. You can see him with his mask and without. It's beautiful. The pages are nice, thick, very high contrast white, so that the black and white art pops. It's heavy, it's good material. There are a number of forewords and afterwards by uh, literature professors, so it helps you get context of what was going on in Argentina, what happened with uh, the writer Esther Held, and there's an opinion by uh, Lopez, the artist. It's a beautiful, beautiful book. Fantagraphics still has this in publication, so this is a book that you can still find today. All right, I give this a strong recommendation in case that's not clear. That's the review. Now let's take a look at what kind of fan art came in this week. William Sanchez returns with another cosmic illustration. This time, it's me with the powers of Captain Marvel. Tyler Garcia sends in artwork called Whatever Happened to Robotron, which I think is based on my robot sidekick, Infotron. Elizabeth Lugo created this awesome art featuring me in my true scroll form. And you can see Elizabeth's Instagram account listed below. Eli Jansen illustrated a cover under my channel's original name, Skunk Ape, and he includes a link to his South African comic book. Connor Wolfshade sent in some great artwork, which is me as Captain Marvell. You can see Connor's Instagram, and he mentions his friend's channel, which is called The Scattered Collector. The artist, known only as Eric P., illustrated me pausing invincible while I finish my beer. Viewer Griffin sent in this illustration where I'm giving myself a hug, and I just love how positive and fun it is. Thank you, Griffin. Keith Cavanaugh from Ireland made this incredibly expressive and stylized illustration of me. I love it, and you can see Keith's Instagram right there. A group called Palgon Comics sent in artwork of me reading their comic. Apparently, you can read more on their Instagram. Nathaniel Westwood from England made this awesome piece where I'm Cyclops, but instead of a force blast, I'm beaming my content to viewers. Matthew Mangi decided to make an amalgamation of Lady Cop and my channel. Very nice result, and you can see Matthew's Twitter handle. Finally, Casey sends in a piece of artwork with a callback to one of the episodes I did with Spider-Man as a guest, and Casey includes his Twitter handle. Folks, if you'd like to create any kind of artwork that's directly related to this channel, I'm always happy to feature that. Just send it to comictropes at gmail.com, I'll feature it, and then I will enter everybody in a chance to win a Gachapon prize that I picked up in Japan. And we get it out of the Gachapony machine, which was donated to me by Lunar Shine Store. So thank you very much for that. All right, the last three people I mentioned each said that they were okay being excluded from the contest, but that still leaves me with nine names, so I'm gonna just sort of drop them in here, and let's see who wins. All right, looks like it is number five. 
All right, number five is Connor Wolfshade. Let's see what you won. Love that sound, I really do. All right, we have a smaller gachapon within this capsule. And what is it? I'm trying to figure it out. Um, just some sort of a weird creature, I guess. I really don't know what to term that. But I found some weird stuff in Japan. Connor, I'll get your mailing address and send this to you. Folks, thank you so much for watching this episode. Uh, thank you to my patrons for voting on it. Uh, I was really excited to analyze this one. It really took me down a path where I ended up reading a lot about Argentina's history. Uh, and ultimately, I had to decide that, okay, I can only include a small portion of that in this video because only only a certain amount is relevant to the topic at hand but it was definitely an interesting read they've had a tumultuous political history very very interesting um, definitely recommend reading up on the dirty war fascinating stuff uh, also um, I wasn't really able to include this within the review but the writer Esterheld had a lot of interesting influences he loved reading sci-fi. He was a voracious reader, and one of his biggest influences was um, Robinson Crusoe, who is a man that's trapped on an island, and basically Esther Held just sort of took that idea and turned it, in, instead of one person, into a small community stuck in a city instead of an island. Um, it's a really interesting way to sort of use the same themes. So if you like this, I also recommend reading Robinson Crusoe. It's, it's what very much inspired this story. He also liked writers like H.G. Wells and sci-fi of, of sort of his era. Um, great, great uh, creator. Uh, too bad that he wasn't able to create more, but at least we have this beautiful, beautiful book uh, that Fantagraphics has translated into English. Uh, I think it's really, really exciting. I read it in basically two sittings. Uh, it's a really big story, but I just sat there and just was like reading page after page and uh, it captured my imagination. I know I'm just sort of speaking off the cuff right now, but it was a really good read and the artwork is phenomenal. Just phenomenal. Um, they knew, uh, these guys like uh, Esther Held and Lopez, they knew some other amazing artists at the time that were traveling to um, Argentina back in the 50s and stuff. Guys like Hugo Pratt that would go on to create some amazing Italian comics. Um, anyway, just a really interesting guy to read up on. I could only include so much. I've included a little bit more in my rambling at the end, but... Um, Definitely recommend it. Uh, hopefully this was an interesting episode to all of you. I really appreciate everybody's support. It was thanks to the support of my patrons that I was able to do this. Uh, you can support me on Patreon if you're able to. I've got different tiers for monthly support. Or if you want to do just a one-time tip, I have something called a coffee account where you can buy me a coffee, essentially. Uh, so anyway, thank you so much for liking and subscribing, all of that stuff, sharing it. We're just about to cross 50,000 subscribers. That's a big deal for me. Thank you very much. That's, that's something that all of you have made possible. Anyway, I've got something cool next week. Until then, keep reading comics.